Today we're going to do something new and examine an early spy movie, Q Planes, or Clouds Over Europe, from 1939, from an historical perspective. We're going to look at what was going on in the real world that influenced this film and what historically was surrounding the making of this movie. So let's dive into the film and the historical impacts on the film right now. Hi, this is Tom Pizzotto and Dan Silvestri of SpyMovieNavigator.com. Join us today on our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, as we look at a spy movie from a fresh angle. Now, we already have a podcast out on Q-Planes where we go into the details of the film and analyze it from a spy movie perspective and what is unfolding scene to scene. It's been very popular. But we were talking to a colleague of ours, John Cork, about this movie Q-Planes, and he thought this fresh approach was a good idea. So, here we go. In general, Dan and I like Q-Planes. The film is a fun watch. The dialogue is quickly paced. It has great characters, and there's a nice bit of action at the end. It's not a film that's going to strain your intellect, however. <laughs> but many spy films are like that. Even so, you do have to think a bit here as you enjoy the unfolding story. Yeah, it's got a bit of a cult following, not anything like Rocky Horror Picture Show or anything. No, but Yeah, not, not quite that <laughs> big of a cult following. No, but people who like spy movies do follow this movie. So it's a good one. So let's, and if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth the watch. Yeah. So let's dive in together here and, because there's some interesting history going on while they're filming this movie. This film was released in very early 1939 in Great Britain, just months before the start of World War II on September 1st of that year. There was a tremendous concern in the UK at the time that British technology was being stolen by the Germans, the Soviets, the Italians, as all of these nations built up their militaries at startling rates. The, the dates of this release is really interesting to me mm -hmm. because you mentioned very early in 1939 but that was really, at least according to IMDb, only in London. It then hit the U.S. in June, and they didn't do the big U.K. release until August 28th, which was just five days before the start of World War II. So either the way that IMDb explains it is incorrect or it was just a London release in February. It hit the U.S. television in 1948, but it took 26 years from its release to land in West Germany on television in 1965. Mm. The other thing with the dates here, too, for me that's kind of interesting, is that the story itself takes place September 20th to 22nd, 23rd, something like that, mm -hmm. just a week before what we're going to talk about next happens, which is the Munich Conference. So, so you know, we... Uh, the, these dates are in the film, right? They're, you figure yeah, this out? Yeah, there's, there's the scene where Hammond is talking to his assistant, the one who's played by Leslie Bradley. And when he's talking to him, he's talking about this thing disappeared on this date from this location, mm -hmm. okay. this on this date from that location. And he goes, and then this is where Hammond made an ass of himself. <laughs> okay. And he says at that point on September 20th. So we know that's right around the time that this thing's supposedly happening, which is right before the Munich conference starts. Another part in that conversation that I kind of found interesting because you, you've heard me talk about in, you know, where they get these characters names. And during that conversation, Hammond is talking about the other planes that are carrying the valuable experimental apparatus mm -hmm. and that there's only three people who are convinced that something else is going on here like he does. He says, Monsieur Gambetta from France and, a, and Robert Hawker from U.S. Intelligence. Leon Gambetta was actually the former prime minister of France in the, in the 1800s, <laughs> and Robert Hawker was a priest and a poet in the 1800s. So I just I love how they just pull these references from historical stuff yeah, or is. from the crew and and just throw them in there. Uh, that's pretty cool. So anyways, we I mentioned here that this this happens right before the Munich conference. Yeah, the the Munich conference, the surrounding elements of of what was going on in the world at that time is Britain was hoping to avoid war with Germany and the nationality in, in the movie of the enemy is never mentioned. But in real life, <laughs> the British were trying to avoid war with Germany at this particular time. And it was during this strange period, 
tensions were so high, but so were the hopes for peace. They really, especially Neville Chamberlain, who was the lead for, for Britain at the time, they wanted peace. So the Munich Conference was this conference hosted by Adolf Hitler in 1938. And the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain, in this conference, Neville Chamberlain agrees to allow Hitler to annex a large swath of German-speaking Czechoslovakia called the Sudanland and essentially chop up Czechoslovakia. Now, the, the weird... So wait, the, the British PM yeah. says, yeah, go ahead and do it. Yeah, but you got to remember here that Hitler had already previously started rearming Germany in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles and also reoccupied the Rhineland in 1936 and annexed Austria in 1938. So who, who's going to believe Hitler here in this conference, the, the Munich conference? The only reason why they would trust Hitler here was to try to avoid war, and that's what Chamberlain was trying to do. So returning from this conference, having signed the Munich Agreement along with France, Italy, and Germany, the Prime Minister Chamberlain declared peace in our time, the words <laughs> that would become infamous as, as Europe <laughs> evolved into war just a year later. So this, this was the headlines in the British newspapers at that time, September 30th, 1938. The headline literally was peace in our time. And then... <laughs> One year later, <laughs> September 3rd, 1939, the headline is Britain at war with Germany. <laughs> so it's like, okay. So this wasn't exactly. It, he didn't define prophetic. how long the time was. No. And it was a year. Yeah. <laughs> so he got a year out of it. And it's like you said, Tom, it's, it, it's like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Take that part of Czechoslovakia. That's okay. This always reminds me of the Soviet Union, which their general philosophy was, let's annex any country that's contiguous with our borders. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much covers everybody. Yeah, it's right? like, yeah, Eventually. I got to take, take this part of Czechoslovakia. It's like, wow. Uh, yeah, so there, there were, actually, there's a website, richardedwards.info, and okay. in 2012, he wrote an article discussing how Q Planes was partially funded by the British Secret Service. Okay. So the movie itself was a propaganda movie at some to some degree. So that article states that in 1938, a revolutionary bomber, the Vickers Wellesley was a prototype. Mm -hmm. It used something called the geodesic construction invented by this guy Barnes Wallace. So it's an airplane now, bomber, not a person, an airplane bomber. Right. It's an airplane yeah, yeah, bomber. Okay, but now right. the interesting thing to me is the what is the name of the airplane company in this movie? Barrett, yeah, Barrett Ward. and Ward. The person who invented this geodesic construction was Barnes Wallace, a BW. So I, uh -huh. I found that interesting. Okay. So this plane, the the Vickers Wellesley, disappeared over the English Channel during a test flight. And then I'm going to quote here. The Air Ministry asked Lord Vansittart of Denham chief of the British Secret Service, to initiate a search for the lost aircraft, wrote Edwards. Hmm. Part of the Wellesley wreckage was supposedly found in a garage in Kiel and was suggested that the ill-fated plane had been shot down by a German U-boat. Wow. The British Secret Service was so sure of this that they partially funded this film wow. to, let, to let the Luftwaffe know they had it figured out. So this was, in part, a message from the British Secret Service to the Germans saying... We know you took that plane down. Lord Vansittart, after all, he was a friend of executive producer Alexander Korda, mm. who got this movie made. So after searching and finding the pieces of the missing prototype, he asked Korda to make this film and gave him some Secret Service funds in order to do it. Wow, that's that's interesting that a historical fact actually was the genesis of of funding, partially at least, this this movie. So in the film itself... Well, it's 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 not even just that to me. Part of it is that the government funding this thing as a movie, but it's really a propaganda. Yeah, especially thing. for the U.S., because the U.S. was neutral, staying neutral at that point, too. And they wanted to kind of up the ante here a little bit to get the U.S. a little more interested in supporting Britain and the U.K., so in the in the film itself, though, they never really say who the enemy is. They don't say, oh, it's Germany or whatever. But based on this historical fact and the kinds of things that are going on in the movie, you could guess that it's Germany. 
Yeah, and and the the accents they use. Yeah. And I also was reading an article that was saying that they didn't need to say that it was Germany. The audience with the with the accents, the audience at the time, would be assuming it was Germany. Yeah, and and the other stuff going on too. Then, while Q planes is being made, it's kind of a unique time in in twentieth century history. It's definitely a time of international tension that's been getting worse and worse day to day, week to week, and a time where British morale and prestige were strained, where Britain seemed to be helpless at the hands of others who were controlling global events from from afar, and for Britain to feel helpless after yeah, that's their a, that's history. That's kind of a that's a strange feeling for them, I bet. Yeah, after their, such a strong history of world power, it was daunting them so this is all going on while this film is being made and the film seems to really kind of reflect those concerns if you take the test planes and the new supercharger that the enemy wants so badly as symbols for british prestige look at what we're doing yeah right that kind of thing the continued and mysterious disappearance of these planes in the films reflects the growing loss of that prestige so if you look at it from both angles you have both of those elements in this film that kind of reflect what's really going on in the world. Well, and they, they even took it to the next step of the headlines that they show. Mm-hmm. And so the, the headlines, you know, they show newspaper headlines from the Times, supposedly, and some of them around this thing. They're really reflective of the headlines that in 1938 raised the alarm over Britain's inability to use its diplomatic and economic might to subdue Germany. Yeah. Right. You know, they instead they go to the Munich and get this Munich agreement, which pretty much says, yeah, go ahead and take over that land. Yeah. Because in in real life in 1938, one of the British headlines in the newspapers was the day before Chamberlain struck this deal at the conference, the Munich conference. And there was a picture of Chamberlain on the front page. And with with the caption, the man the world looks to. I mean, <laughs> so there's their prestige, like our guys, the guy the world is looking to. And then he goes to the conference, and the day <laughs> after the headlines is peace in our peace time. In our time. So, yeah. All right, so there there you go with trying to build up this this British prestige. Well, and the thing too is, if you look at the prestige. Britain had defeated Germany just two decades ago. Yeah, right. And, and so that kind of proud element of, of the, the history of Britain is really killing them here. So literally a year a year later, September of, of 39, the headlines were Britain at war with Germany. <laughs> Britain at war, the ultimatum by France expires at 5 p.m. Or the country is at war. So it didn't work. So the prestige that they were putting into Chamberlain to go do this deal and keep out of war with Germany failed. So So we've got that historical background for the setting and the British people's thinking of what's going on at that time. So it's interesting to me here, besides this whole British prestige thing, Mm -hmm. is then how they try to make the characters appear to us to grab some of the way society was working then right so it's really it's it's a fascinating window into this era as well first we have the essential eccentric british gentleman who wears a hat and carries an umbrella major charles hammond played by the great sir ralph richardson he's a fairly young man hammond has his own butler he's very much of a snob yeah and he works for british intelligence He's worked all over the British Empire, we, we found out, despite all of his eccentricities. So he must be really good at what he does. He's shown as the kind of brilliant oddball who makes Britain fantastic. Mm. Now, let's see. He's a public servant, yeah. dis, despite some clear family wealth. He's kind of a Sherlock Holmes in his analytical and logistical abilities. Yeah. And there's another person from history that we can think about that also was a little bit eccentric, came from a family wealth, uh-huh. and worked for British intelligence, and that would be <laughs> Ian? Ian, Fle- Ian Fleming. <laughs> okay. So that character, that's kind of neat how they wrapped him up. Now, his sister, Kay Hammond, 
She's a reporting for the, reporter for the newspaper. She's beautiful. She's resourceful. And despite annoying everyone, yeah, her reporting she be, she's she's good at that. Yeah. Her her reporting com, becomes vital to uncovering the spy plot. Yes, there is a spy plot. This is a spy movie. <laughs> it is a spy movie, right? really. Yeah. Next, and this is I love this part is the rugged, handsome Sir Lawrence Olivier yeah. plays the test pilot Tony McVeigh. He is kind of ironically the most down to earth, believable, normal character in a great test pilot who speaks his mind and doesn't shy away from using his fists. Where Major Hammond is a feat or pretentious, Tony McVeigh is ready to charge into battle. And I love how you've got these two absolutely classic great actors in these roles, both acting wonderfully without a feeling overacted or anything, but just seeing these two guys who are just icons of the acting world in a film together, it was just fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the heroes of this film. And again, seemingly to represent Britain's strengths. They're tough, rugged, individualist, well-educated, devoted to to be public servants, much like James Bond was a loyal public servant. Queen and country. And they had a very robust press that held everyone accountable. Boy, we could use that today in the U.S. That'd be kind of nice, <laughs> wouldn't it? Wait, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't go there. <laughs> uh, the, the film, besides presenting the prestige and strengths of British characters, it also presents some less admirable British characters, like Barrett. The guy. Well, you've got to have the antagonists. Right? Yeah, Barrett's the the head of the company that's manufacturing the planes, Barrett and Ward. He's he's a rich, vain, inconsistent industrialist who seems to worry more about his his own prestige than than what's really happening than an actual fact. I've got to look good. Yeah, he's that's look him. Good. Yeah, he wants to downplay any bad news and over celebrate good news. <laughs> Okay, a lot of politicians do the same thing. Yeah, that's exactly the <laughs> definition of a politician, but he's running a company. Yeah, and if you're watching the movie, he's a constant source of frustration and impetuously making bad decisions that keep feeding the enemy British aviation technology. So he's, Yeah, oh, you stole, you stole that plane here. I'll put another one up that's yeah, got some secrets in it. Again, ignoring the facts and just kind of looking at his own prestige. The other is played by a great actor, George Curzon who plays Jenkins, and he's a corrupt employee of Barrett's who is feeding intelligence to the enemy for money. Yeah, he plays that slimy guy really well. <laughs> he does. He, and he's terrific at it. And, of course, this, this happens in the real world, too. Like the Cambridge Five in the U.K. that was spearheaded by Kim, Kim Philby. You can Google that. There's a whole, That's a tremendous yeah, but... story about double agents selling out their country and stuff. Yeah, but in the, it, there, the, to me, the big difference there is that this was an employee of the company. He wasn't really well working for the government. He was working just as a as just a jerk. And Philby was actually an agent. He was so a double he agent. Was, Philby, he was, yeah. yeah, he he was the classic double agent. He was a he was an agent for both sides. Where Jenkins is isn't an agent. He's just a slimy guy just doing deals on both sides yeah but you know what he's, so if, he's if acting Hammond like had an actually been the one to turn the enemy mm. i think it would have been closer to the philby yeah, i think jenkins comparison. is acting like an agent though there's there's no distinction between what he's doing and acting like a double agent he's he's working for a company selling secrets to the enemy and getting paid by the enemy and going back and and pretending he's a, a loyal employee yeah i'm gonna yeah, call to him me, i'm gonna yeah, call to him me an the agent. big the big difference <laughs> is that he's he's not working for the government no, technically not working for the government. That's true. So, and then when Jenkins is foiled by the the subterfuge of Major Hammond, the villains send goons out to kill Jenkins because they think they're that Jenkins has has sold them out, and because they didn't get the supercharger, and Jenkins said it was going to be on the plane and all that kind of stuff. So, well, it's interesting to me because because of Hammond's action. Mm-hmm to remove the, the supercharger from the plane, they they go to kill Jenkins, and Hammond ends up saving him. Yeah. 
so he with the first he's going to get the guy killed and then he get grabs him with the umbrella and saves him and then he still ends up perishing yeah hammond saves jenkins but then eventually jenkins gets killed and hammond finds that there's a compact that says sonia on it that that was jenkins girlfriend so he goes out to try to find out who she is and this is actually a really fascinating scene at first you're going like why is this in here Mm-hmm. It, it it kind of seemed a little out of place. He walks into this the room, the dressing room, and Sonia's sitting there with her back to him, talking to, you know, kind of holding court. You know, with other he, act, actresses. Yeah, with the other actresses. So she's a sh- showgirl, and Hammond suspects she might be a honey trap, right? A beautiful woman working for the enemy to lure someone to become a traitor. But he gets to her dressing room at the theater and finds she's self-centered, very talkative, doesn't seem to be very bright, and she's holding court nonstop. Yeah, and he realizes talking. that she's really too dumb to be, and, and self-absorbed to be the enemy. Like I said, it seems like this scene's going nowhere. But if you looked at what was happening at the time, and Sonia seemed to be American. Yeah, she was right? definitely an American yeah, she, actress. Yeah. So she was an American actress. I think it delivered a message that the filmmakers wanted to send to the British viewers. And that was, well, America wasn't the enemy and wasn't stealing British secrets or plotting against Britain or anything. Right. It couldn't be relied upon for help. The young, rich nation might be beautiful, mm-hmm. like Sonia, yeah. but was too stupid and isolated to do much more than distract Britain from Europe's problems. Yeah. America at this time was remaining neutral. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't think it was an uh, an issue of being stupid, and I don't even know if she was stupid, Sonia, in the movie. But well, I, she didn't exactly sound brilliant. <laughs> no, she wasn't brilliant. She was self absorbed and talking about herself, basically. <laughs> that's 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 all she was doing, really. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I think the point was, yeah, America's still neutral, is remaining neutral, and how can we kind of encourage them? to be supporting the UK when things start popping. And that was, I think that's true, though. That was the message, Tom. That's good. As we talked about before, what the film does not do is define who exactly the enemy might be. So we never understand who is stealing the planes, never understand completely why. Were they acting as agents for a government or independent agents? I don't know. We don't know. And maybe this, in many ways, is... Not important. The film is more about defining British resolve and, like we were saying before, the resourcefulness than warning of any real threats. But again, like Tom mentioned earlier, the British Secret Service funded part of Cube Lanes, and that makes you wonder. (laughs) That makes you wonder. Yeah, it does definitely change the dynamic of understanding the movie. Yeah. So as you know, if you listen to our podcast, we... We really like Alfred Hitchcock movies. We've done three of them already. Yeah, and, you think? <laughs> and, and we're going to do more. This film... You we, have to like the master. Yeah, exactly. This film, I think, consciously tries to copy the style of Alfred Hitchcock, giving us a pair of kind of breezy, amusing leading men, Major Hammond and Tony McVeigh, lots of witty dialogue, strong emphasis on British upper-class eccentricities and style in an absurd rollicking kind of adventure spy adventure yeah so let's see hitchcock he's been down this road he did yeah. that in the 39 steps in 1935 yes. he did 36 he did secret agent yeah 38 he did the lady vanishes mm-hmm. and in fact in both q planes and the 39 steps the secret the unnamed foreign power is trying to steal relates to aircraft engines. True. In the 39 steps, it was something to make them completely silent. And in Q planes, it was how to supercharge them and make them go faster. Yeah. In both cases, they're classic cases of what Hitchcock called the MacGuffin. As we mentioned in an earlier podcast on Q planes, many fans of the 1960s, television series the avengers have embraced this movie as well and even james bond fans who are looking to see connections between q planes and james bond in the movies 
But here you could see the link to the Avengers comes from Patrick McNee, who was a big fan of the film Q Planes. And while he was promoting his book on the Avengers television show, he told Susan King of Los Angeles Times in 1998 that he based some of the look of John Steed directly from Ralph Richardson's Major Hammond in Q Plans. Well, if you're going to borrow from anybody, Ralph Richardson's a pretty good one to borrow from. Yeah. So part of what Patrick McNee said in that article was this. I thought, what does an Englishman really signify? I use Leslie Howard in the Scarlet Pimpernel as an example. My father was a little dandy man with his pearl pins and his cravats. I had a commanding officer in the Navy. He used to go into battle with white scarves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, this is all a quote from him. Yeah. And then I thought of Ralph Richardson in the 1939 film Q Planes. It was an extraordinary performance. I think he wore a bowler hat or one of those Hamburgs. Somehow it all worked. So there you go. Yeah, and to actually kind of double down on this, right, where you've got uh, Patrick McNee making this comment, in that same article I mentioned before by Richard Edwards, he mentions that the Avengers co-creator, Brian Clemens, said that Richardson's portrayal of Hammonds was the inspiration for John Steed. There you go. So what he was saying was it wasn't just the way that Patrick McNee was going to become John Steed and the characterizations of the character. Also, it was in the way they wrote it. it you know, apparently, if I, if I interpret this from Brian Clemens correctly. So it's pretty well known that a lot of John Steed's character came from the character in Q Plains. Major Hammond. So, and the the umbrella is being a key part of the scene and very clever. He's got, we find out later, a ton of umbrellas and so on. It's all part I love of, that. Well, it's not just the umbrellas. There's a whole thing of hats. The and, hats. You know, in that scene, you've got all the umbrellas there, and he was looking for a hat, and the hat was on the end of the umbrella that, that his butler was holding, yet he had probably 30 of identical hats sitting there in the closet. Yeah, which is pretty clever, and it, it really makes the umbrella more than just uh, a little British character quirk. It really makes it part of Major Hammond's character, and that becomes part of John Steed's character as well. But, well, and it was important to Major Hammond and to Jenkins because he used the umbrella to hook Jenkins and save him yeah, from so, the guys that were trying to run him down. Yeah. So let's move on to some of the tenuous links to James Bond, which come through this movie and from the screenplay. Well, some of them aren't so tenuous. Yeah. Our, our first podcast on it, you'll see a few other things in there. Here we're going to talk about a few things that are there and are interesting. The movie has several writers who receive screen credit. Probably the most famous was Arthur Wimperis, who is credited along with two others as having developed the screen story. And the two others really are Ian Dalrymple and Brock Williams. So two years after writing Q Planes, Wimperis set sail for Canada on his way to Hollywood to escape the Battle of Britain. He was a passenger on the city of Benares, an ocean liner that was carrying 90 children to be relocated in Canada. A Nazi U-boat struck the ship with torpedoes and Wimperis was in a lifeboat that was responsible for rescuing many of the children. It was a terrifying ordeal with over 200 passengers drowning or expiring in lifeboats due to the exposure. And 77 of those were children. So a couple years later, Wimperis wins an Oscar for his contribution to the screenplay for Mrs. Miniver, 1942 film, which, which won Best Picture. And that wasn't his only Oscar for nomination that year. He was also nominated for the screenplay for Random Harvest, working with much the same group that wrote Mrs. Miniver. But Wimperis... So wait, so if he hadn't actually been rescuing people and on that lifeboat and saved... We wouldn't have gotten these other movies, probably. Yeah. He or they would have been, been very this. different films. Right. If he hadn't been heading to Hollywood for to advance his career, basically, and escape the Battle of Britain, primarily, then, yeah, we wouldn't have had these other movies. It's kind of wild how history works like that. Yeah. But Wimperus has no connection to Bond, really. Yeah, th that's true. Yeah. So where is the connection to Bond? There, there was... There's a fourth writer, Dan. Exactly. There was a fourth writer... Who was it? Jack Whittingham. 
Well, where have we heard that name before? Who links, yeah, who links for sure mm -hmm. this film to James Bond. So this isn't so tenuous. If you <laughs> yeah, this one, this one's pretty direct. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know who, who Jack Whittingham is and his little story, uh, here are the highlights. In 59, Ian Fleming was convinced that his friend Ivor Bryce was about to really strike it big as a movie producer and with another friend, Ernest Cuneo. They thought they could make a James Bond film largely set in the Bahamas due primarily because of some tax advantages there and maybe even build a, a soundstage space on New Providence Island there. It's amazing how tax advantages play but it's still going such, an important, yeah, yeah. such an important role in how yeah. movies are made. Absolutely. As Bond fans know, the whole enterprise ended in a cascading series of lawsuits and fights that continued until 2000. It's amazing how the legal process can just drag on and on and on. It was a battle. And out of all of that effort came the James Bond novel, Thunderball, and eventually the film Thunderball, and eventually the movie, Never Say Never <laughs> Again. <laughs> Yikes. But, but why did all of that happen? Well, yeah, way back in 59, at the suggestion of this guy, Kevin McClory, Ivor Bryce hired Jack Whittingham to write the screenplay for this James Bond film that they were thinking of doing in the Bahamas, as we said. By the time Whittingham came in, a lot of the ideas were already in place, but the basics of the plot of Thunderball are all very similar to the broad plot of Q-Planes. A group of villains want some bit of technology from the British. To get it, they're going to force a British plane to land at sea. They're going to harvest what they want from the plane using a ship that is supposedly looking for gold or treasure or whatever. A little different in Thunderball, but close concept. Very, very similar in concept. Yeah. yeah. So when Whittingham came on to the James Bond project in 59, 1959, Kevin McClory had already written a memo about his desire to have a British plane armed with nuclear weapons hijacked in midair. In Whittingham's first memo on the plot, he details how this could occur which is completely different than the way the plane is forced to land at sea in Q planes. But the concept... Yeah, the overall of, concept is there. The mechanics of how they did it are yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. So we've never seen any record of Fleming or McClory or Ivor Bryce or Ernest Cuneo knowing anything about Q planes. It could have been one of their favorite films, or <laughs> maybe they never even saw it. Well, but, yeah, but Whittingham knew the film. Clearly. Like he had to, right? Yeah, clear, he helped come up with the story. Clear, but clearly so Whittingham knew it. So as, aside from the elements of treasure hunting, gold prospecting, or whatever, and the landing of the planes in the open water, and a battle between good guys and bad guys during the climax, there really aren't a lot of other similarities. But but this is a big one because it's really... Yeah, you have one of the actually, writers. Yeah. How they actually perform the, the evil deed they do. Yeah, yeah. And you have one of the writers who was writing for Q-Planes and writing for Thunderball. So there you go. So, I, I don't know. Some people, you talk to people, they see more similarities, really, in You Only Live Twice, The Spy Who Loved Me, and Moonraker, basically substituting the British planes and Q-Planes for space capsules, submarines, and space shuttles that are being captured by the enemy with the crews being locked up. And it's amazing <laughs> how these things all similar. <laughs> you see in so many different movies. Yeah. It's it's we have this theme of this we're capturing this thing we want and we're we're surrounding it with something in this case engulfing it in the in the in the ship and then in these James Bond movies we see you know the same plot kind of repeats itself over and over again. Yeah. And just as in The Spy Who Loved Me where Stromberg can disable the submarines the enemy in Q planes has some ability to disable the planes in flight. That's how they get force the plane to land. Mm -hmm. This appears to be some sort of super weighty radio wave or something, ray or something like that, which in its own way is kind of reminiscent of Dr. No's technology of scrambling the gyroscopes on rockets as they launch using these powerful radio signals from Crab Key. Yeah, but there are other movies about about death rays that preceded really all of this. For instance, Air Hawks in, in 1935 was a movie about this. And it, it, just quickly, it was competing airlines trying to get the, the government contract to deliver mail. 
And so one of them develops a death ray to kind of knock out the other. So this is in 1935. Ralph, I think Ralph Bellamy is in that one. And the engine sputters, the plane crashes, and all that kind of stuff. 1935, I think there was another one in 35, the fighting Marines. Again, some kind of ray gun or gravitational gun and so on. Even in 1936, the Ghost Patrol is same kind of thing, targeting mail planes and the plane has mechanical difficulties and crashes. So a lot of this comes from the 1920s, really. So all this was before Q planes. And there was a real scientist, this guy, Oliver Lodge, who said that the Earth possessed some kind of type of powerful energy force and that such a power can be harnessed or unlocked at some point. So the 1920s, you had a, even in the 20s, you had a lot of stuff, the Invisible Ray story, the flaming disc story, which is basically a huge magnifying glass kind of as a, a focus beam kind of thing. So this stuff has been around. So it's not brand new in Q plans here either. I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> so just like real world events that impacted what went into this movie, other movies that preceded it and other movies that followed it were impacted or were impacted by Q planes. In Q planes, some people even look at the iris that opens to allow the enemy spotter to see the targets and speculate that this was copied by Maurice Binder when he created the original gun barrel image. Nah, no, it wasn't, as Binder really was photographing the inside of a gun barrel, and we were seeing something much more akin to a camera iris working in Q planes. But was it inspiration? Who knows? Finally, we have the title, Q Planes which probably reminds Bond fans of Q in the novels and the films. But the title here likely originates from a completely different place. I have to admit, I was thinking that too, uh, because you have the Q boat in in one of the Bond films. So the Q in Q planes is a reference to something called Q ships. All right. And these these were freighters or steamers designed to look like non-military ships that would be easy targets for the German U-boats. So the idea here was that the U-boat would surface Mm -hmm. to uh, attack the ship, and then the Q-ship would reveal its guns and blast away at the the U-boat. Okay. So now the British public loved these things in World War I. They were very, very popular with the British public, but according to some historians, they really weren't terribly effective. And in World War II, they were even less effective. Yeah, I, I think actually in World War One they lost 61 Q-ships. I mean, Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I yeah. But the Brits loved them. Yeah. Now, the designation Q in this case comes from the ships being outfitted in Queensland, Ireland, and it helped promote the idea of Q being a designation for taking something ordinary and outfitting it to be a deadly weapon, which does kind of have a Q in the Bond world feel. Yeah, right, taking some, you know, how many times it's the exploding pen or it's you sit on the couch and it, it sucks you in or whatever. Yeah, in, in, in the beginning, too, of World War II, when they were talking about reinstituting Q-ships, they codenamed the Project LQ, and they were calling them Queen Ships at that point, but probably from Queensland, the same concept that you were just talking about. Yeah. In the film Q-Planes, the, the planes themselves aren't used like the Q ships. They're not disguised and have something else happen to them. They're planes, they get get brought down. The the title appears to have been thought of more of a marketing ploy to UK audiences than how it relates to the plot. I mean, they never use the word Q planes in the movie. No, they don't. Now, the film's working title was Foreign Sabotage, which actually is a good title for this movie. It's very on point but it might have been confusing to the 1936 movie Sabotage, mm-hmm. although that didn't stop Hitchcock in 1942 of then coming out with Saboteur. So Hitchcock had Sabotage and Saboteur as movies. But in the Bond films, Q creates a lot of very ordinary-looking things that have extraordinary capabilities. And for many in the British public of a certain age, the title Q would have linked back to and drummed up ideas of Q-ships and their secret cache of deadly weapons. That's what they would have thought of with the title Q. There is another tenuous link to Bond, and this one's pretty tenuous. The story in Q-Planes centers around these missing planes that are testing a new 
supercharger. Those who have wait, read, wait, Dan, what, what, what's a supercharger? The supercharger is in Q planes going to make the planes go faster. It's going to supercharge the engine of the plane and make the plane go faster. So, if you've read any of the Bond novels, which we all should, they're terrific. You'll note that in yeah, the, if you're just the, if you're just the Bond movie fan, the books are a great read. They are. And in the early ones, the early books, Bond drives a four and a half liter Bentley, but it's sporting a supercharger built by Amherst Villiers. What exactly is this supercharger? And why were they so big in the 1930s? Simply, it's just an extra motor that pushes more oxygen into a cylinder in an internal combustion engine, which provides more power. This way, you can make a smaller, lighter engine produce more horsepower and attain greater speeds. And Bond that, that would be that would be one. good in a plane. Yeah, that'd be good in a plane. And Bond had it in his four and a half liter Bentley. That's what he actually drives in the books in the early books. So there are two other exceedingly minor links to Bond here, and the first is the film's executive producer, Sir Alexander Corda. Mm-hmm. Now there's no credit for Corda on the version of the film on Amazon. But Corda, through his company, London Films, may, had made a production deal with Irving Asher, this American guy who produced the film. On the Amazon print of the film, the distributors cut off all the company credits, including copyright credits, because they likely believe the film's copyright has been abandoned. But a little digging turns up Corda's involvement. He was a Hungarian Jew who made films in, the, in Hungary, Austria, and Berlin, and even Hollywood, before emigrating to Britain and becoming one of the most important figures in British film history. Corda died in 56, but, and again, we said this was tenuous. In the late 53 or early 54, he read a proof copy of Live and Let Die. And so then Corda writes to Ian Fleming, saying he has a clear interest. There's a connection. (laughs) Yeah, there's a connection. But he had a clear interest in producing a James Bond film. Remember, no, the Bond films hadn't been made yet. But, he died before any of the Bond movies came out. Although the only thing that might have really come out of Corda's interest is that when Fleming wrote the next Bond novel, Moonraker, 1955, actually, it was in 1955, he, he wrote it and it really had a more cinematic feel to the style of the writing with the way the, the visuals were described and the very tight structure to the Mm. novel. So Corda's interest might have influenced uh, Ian Fleming. Yeah. The way he wrote it. Actually, that's true. Uh, It's one of my favorite novels that Fleming wrote. I love Moonraker. Again, you got to take it at its time, but yeah, maybe that's a good point that he wrote it with a film in mind and made it more visual and, and so on. But it is, it's a great book. So It is, and so right. there's there's a there's a fairly tenuous a slight little connection. tie in there right. uh, with, with, with Corda there. Now, the final link to the world of 007 is even beyond tenuous. I mean, uh, okay. it, this one actually doesn't really exist, but we're going to comment on it anymore. Any, anyway, so we talked about the two great actors, Laurence Olivier and Ralph Richardson. Neither of them did any James Bond films. No. But they did do a number of films together over the years, and one only one centered on these British warplanes, besides Q planes, and the producer of that movie, which was called The Battle of Britain. Which was big. Which was a big movie in 1969, was Harry Saltzman. Okay, well, hey, that's not so tenuous. <laughs> well, I don't know, but... Again, as we talked about before, these guys were the, they were the two of the holy trinity of British stage actors, along with John Gilgood, who we talked about in Secret Agent. Yeah, he was fabulous. And so it is just really cool to see these guys in there, and they do a great job of, when they're out there, you're not sitting there thinking, hey, that's Hamlet, or, or that's Falstaff. It's, they have very different styles to between each other, but also they were able to take different character types and portray them well, um, which just fascinates me. From yeah, a, they really elevated the the whole fabric of Q-Planes with their appearance in it. They were fabulous. The film's history is, is kind of interesting, too. Columbia Pictures picked it up for distribution in, in the U.S. and the United States. Although in 1939, the United States was technically still very neutral. 
Many of the Hollywood studios, which were most often run by Jewish folks, were horrified by the rise of Hitler and were eager to distribute films that supported nations trying to stand up to the Nazis. So Q Planes was seen as a film that fit that mold. Columbia renamed the film Clouds Over Europe, focusing on the risk of war. A short introduction was shot and added to the U.S. prints. So, again, historically, they were using this as basically propaganda to get the U.S. to pay more attention to what was really going on with Nazism and Hitler's movement. Yeah, and the U.S. release with that name, we mentioned in the other podcast on on Q Planes, but I want to redo this again, is when you're looking online, different, different websites will use clouds over Europe instead of Q planes or, you know, vice versa. So when you're doing your search, if you're not finding what you're looking for, look for the other name. And interestingly enough, Q planes was one of the first movies that was sold into kind of a licensing package, I guess, to television, which was new at the time. And so in the the late forties and early fifties, people were able to see this film on TV. And in the fifties, it still worked pretty well for audiences because of this unnamed power, again, capturing these planes that really kind of fit in with the whole Cold War anxieties that were going on at the time in the 50s and certainly in the early 60s. So, well, that's really the whole Cold War thing is what allowed us to get the world of James Bond. Yeah, true. So lots of fun facts and connections here to real-world stuff and to other films and how they all connect. Well, and you also can tell that we like this movie because we've now done two podcasts on it from different angles. Yeah, you have to see it. it, It's a fun movie. It's not a long movie. Highly recommend you watch this thing. Yeah. Well, that wraps up our historical perspective of the movie Q Planes. In many ways, Q Planes is a curiosity, probably better known today because of the connection to the Avengers TV series and the vague links to James Bond more than the quality of the film itself, but we like this film a whole lot, and we think it's a pretty darn good movie. We looked at Q Planes from our film analysis perspective in our podcast, Q Planes, Clouds Over Europe. Today, we looked at Q Planes in an historical context as a window into British identity and concerns in the brief period between the Munich Conference and Germany's invasion of Poland. So, Should we do more podcasts from this historical perspective on films? Tell us what you think. We'd like to give a shout out to Real Art Collectibles. That's real, R-E-E-L. Corey Glaberson, who runs the shop, has tons of movie collectibles from every genre, including spy movie stuff. He has over 100,000 movie posters and some very cool Bond ones. Or check with Corey. He might have some Q-Plane memorabilia as well. Check out our podcast on Real Art Collectibles. Corey will ship anything he has anywhere in the world and can even help you find what you are looking for in movie collectibles. Real Art Collectibles at realartcollectibles.com, R-E-E-L, 6727 Stanley Avenue, Berwyn, Illinois. The store phone number is 708-637-3244 and Corey's number is 708-288-7378. And for you non-U.S. people, that would be a plus one in front of that. Correct. And look for our video podcast on Real Art Collectibles, and you can see some of the things Corey has on our YouTube channel, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Thanks, Corey. This has been Tom Pizzotto. And Dan Silvestri. From SpyMovieNavigator.com. Thanks for joining us today on our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Please subscribe to our show through your favorite podcast app, and be sure to give us a five-star rating. And please tell your friends about us. 